clock isn't just measuring time on the wall. It's actually part of time itself. And given that Simon's invited us to anchor this on COVID-19, I mean, age is the dominant risk factor for serious illness and death with um, COVID-19. Well, yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, and even if you subtract all of the age-related diseases, such as diabetes and obesity, which of course play a role, age is still the biggest risk factor. There was a study that came out uh, just last night uh, from the UK that said, uh, the top risk factors are actually in order, the top five, the least is diabetes, then obesity, then being male, then cancers of the blood, and by far, five times more than anything else, it's your age, how many birthday candles you've had. And my point is that aging is a disease, It's and it's treatable. Uh, that's the main point. Um, and the same way we've worked on those other diseases one by one, now's the time to turn our attention to the main driver of illness and susceptibility to death, and that is aging itself. Uh, but while we've you know, rallied against particular diseases, uh, we've left one thing on the table, the, the most important one, which is our physical decline over time. We call this aging, but aging is a disease. Let, let me explain why. It, so first of all, aging results in a physical decline. I think we'd agree with that. That's a, that's a disease. It limits the quality of life. That's a disease. And it has a very specific pathology. You know, I can look at you and I can see that you have some of that pathology. If I look at your organs, I can see that it has pathology. Aging does all of this. And in doing so, it fulfills every category of what we call a disease, except one. And that is that it impacts, impacts more than half of the population. Um, but there's no good reason why we have to say that something that happens so, hold, to 49%. Hold on a second. It, it affects half the population? What do you mean it affects half the population? Well, so what? if you look at the manuals of geriatrics, the definition of aging uh, is that it's exactly the same as diseases, except that it affects more than half the population. Okay, so, but what I want to make the argument here is that there's no good reason why we have to say that something that happens to 49.9% .9 of the population, whether it's heart disease, or diabetes, why do we call that a disease? But then something that happens to say 51%, or in the case of aging, 70 to 80% of us, if we live long enough, um, why that is something we should just cast aside and say, well, that's just life. Let's just, you know, that's natural. Uh, we don't call cancer natural anymore. We don't call heart disease natural anymore, even though they are natural. Uh, what we do is we fight against them and the difference between those things and aging is that we we didn't have an understanding of why aging occurs, but now we do. And so we can address it just like every other medical condition. Uh, well, we, we used to think it was uh, just damage to the DNA. We found out that it, it, it's not just that. There are a lot of other things that happen. And we, we came up in my field, there's a few hundred excellent researchers who work on this. We call this uh, aging research or longevity research. We came up with eight or nine hallmarks of aging. Uh, we don't call these causes of aging because that would be too scandalous, but we, we call them hallmarks of aging. And these are things you've probably heard of. I know you've reported on them. Uh, senescent cells, zombie cells in the body, uh, loss of stem cells, telomeres, so the end of chromosomes gets shorter. There's, there's a list. But what I've been working on for my career, uh, and I believe getting increasingly close, is to identifying what makes all of those things happen. Can you boil the aging process down to an equation that explains why we don't live longer than we actually do and why some species do live for hundreds and some for thousands of years. Oh, well, there are lots of species that live longer than us. We, we tend to forget that we're not uh, at, the, at the peak of evolution. Uh, so one of the best examples is a bowhead whale uh, or a Greenland shark. They live hundreds of years. Uh, and we know this, for example, because uh, people captured bowhead whales and they found a spear tip in, embedded in the skin of the whale. Uh, and those spear tips hadn't been around for at least 150 years, and they dated the whale to at least 200 years old. Well, so first of all, it's important to know that our lifespan and our health in old age 
uh, only 20% of that we inherit from our parents. The rest is mainly up to how we live our lives. So that's very, that's empowering. And what we have seen is that there's an internal biological clock that ticks away and we can measure it in the lab. Norman, I could take your, your blood uh, or you could send it to me. And in a few days, I could tell you very precisely how old you are uh, and what you're, when you're likely to die, what year, and even could make a guess at what month. That's if you continue doing what you do. And I hope that you're healthy. You, you, I'm sure you are. You're a doctor. Uh, but if you smoke, you can have the clock accelerate. Uh, and if you eat well, if you eat less often, if you exercise, uh, you can slow that clock. So what is that clock? It's called the epigenetic clock. Uh, and it's actually, the epigenome is the key word here. So let me explain briefly. There are two types of information in the body. One is genetic, the information we get from our parents. But the other type of information that is equally important is what's called the epigenetic component. And that can change with how we live our lives. And the epigenome, just to summarize, is how the cell reads the DNA. So a cell that's in your in your brain has to use a particular type of epigenome to stay a nerve cell and a skin cell uses a different epigenome. And it's the loss of that epigenomic information that I believe is the main driver of the aging process. In other words, aging is just simply a loss of information over time. Now, is that, so just let's just, because people, as soon as you start talking about epigenetics, people kind of lose the plot a little bit because it gets incredibly, in, so essentially you've got your genetic code and you've got the shape, if you like, of the double helix, which can get contorted and uh, affected by the chemicals on the outside of the double helix. And different things can influence that and the different shape and conformations can affect almost like a volume switch, how well the genes work. But um, there are lots of different things that, affect the, the epigenome and there are lots of different, different chemical structures on the DNA which uh, which uh, influence that. So there's methylation and various other things, I don't want to get too technical here. But is it the whole suite of things or is there one particular element of the epigenome, one particular chemical species that, that affects it all or is it a generalization? Uh, well, we know of one particular chemical mark that gets changed over time, and that's what we call the epigenetic clock. That's the DNA methylation. So methylation is just a little chemical that sticks to the, the letter C in our genome. And we can read that with a little machine about the size of a candy bar, um, and we can. that's how we read the clock. Uh, those little methyl groups change in our bodies over time, and we just read them. But that's not the only thing that changes with time. The epigenome, as you said, involves proteins that loop DNA or bundle it up very tightly like a spool or, or a hose on a driveway so that those genes stay off. And we're just learning how to fully understand how that structure is behaving over time during aging. But those DNA methyl marks are a very good clock. Now, one of the biggest discoveries that's happened over the last 12 months, uh, and I was very fortunate that my PhD student uh, was one of the people who helped discover this, is that those DNA methylation marks, when we wind back aging, and we, as I mentioned, we have a way of doing that now, those DNA methyl methylation marks, you have to remove them for the age of the cell to go back and for the cell to behave its, as though it's young again. So in other words, the clock isn't just measuring time on the wall, it's actually part of time itself. Mm -hmm.